Hi, good evening. Um, today we're going to start talking about Leibniz, launch into Leibniz. <clears throat> so, uh, Spinoza, remember, believes that um, his whole philosophical worldview is derived from, in fact, is deducible from some fundamental definitions and axioms. So, too, Leibniz believes that his philosophical worldview is derivable from a few, maybe one, primary truth. So what we're going to do today is investigate Leibniz on primary truths. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time introducing you to some vocabulary and concepts that are going to be necessary for us to understand Leibniz, but also for us to understand uh, David Hume as we move down the line and Immanuel Kant. But first, a little bit of fun um, from my favorite musician. If it wants it, gonna study. So this is our man, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. <clears throat> he lived from 1646 to 1716. So Denis Diderot, uh, the author of the Encyclopedia, which was sort of a compendium of uh, Enlightenment knowledge. Um, Diderot was certainly no intellectual slouch himself, uh, had this to say about Leibniz. He said, when one compares the talents one has with those of a Leibniz, one is tempted to throw away one's books and go die quietly in the dark of some forgotten corner. Leibniz was perhaps the last universal genius. He made significant contributions in metaphysics, in epistemology, in logic, in philosophy of religion, as well as in mathematics, physics, geology, jurisprudence, and history. He invented the calculus about the same time as Newton did. It is Leibniz's um, notation that we use to this day. He built one of the first calculators, a calculating computer. Um, he wrote in Latin, in German, in French, and he wrote letters, sorry, letters in English. When Leibniz was writing was just about the time when academic journals began to spring, spring up in Europe. Um, he published in those journals. He edited some of those journals. So, for example, the little piece that we were, I asked you to read, Primary Truths, was published in an academic journal first. Um, uh, he did write some treatises, but Leibniz never published a magnum opus. He never published anything like uh, akin to Spinoza's Ethics or Descartes' Meditations on First Philosophy, which offered an overview or a synopsis of his whole philosophical system. So we have to put it together from bits and pieces here and there. Uh, they aren't always consistent, as we'll see, um, but I think a consistent view does arise, and we're going to focus on uh, that kind of, uh, on tracking down that consistent view. So I want to start talking about Leibniz's primary truths. So in the monadology, he talks about uh, his reasonings being based on two great principles. The first principle is the principle of contradiction. This symbology, I will explain the symbolic expression here. This little symbol here and here is a, is a negation. This symbol is a conjunction. It's equivalent to an and sign. So literally this reads that it is not the case that A and not A. Literally it is not the case that A and not A. That is, contradictory propositions cannot both be true in the same sense and at the same time. He puts it this way. In, uh, this, this principle, that of contradiction, in virtue of which we judge that which involves a contradiction to be false and that which is opposed or contradictory to the false to be true. The second great principle we've met before is the principle of sufficient reason. Nothing happens without a reason. 
He says, by virtue of sufficient reason, we consider that we can find no true or existent fact, no true assertion, without there being a sufficient reason why it is thus and not otherwise. Although most of the time, these reasons cannot be known to us. So Leibniz makes it clear there, most of the time these reasons cannot be known by us, <clears throat> that his principle, the principle of sufficient reason, is a metaphysical principle. It tells us the way the world is organized. It doesn't tell us what can or cannot be known. It's not an epistemological principle, but a metaphysical one. Now, in earlier writings, he suggests that there might be more than two basic principles. Um, uh, the, the, the issue here is how many do we need as basic and how many can be derived from others. So other candidates for basic principles, and this principle is enormously important in Leibniz as we will see moving forward. One of them is the predicate in notion principle. And this is its most um, grand expression. And we're going to work slowly towards it. Basically, the predicate and notion principle holds that a subject term always contains the predicate term. So think of subject predicate sentences. We're going to come back to this in a minute, but think of the sentence, curry is bald, where curry is the subject and bald is the predicate that is being um, as uh, ascribed to curry. So Leibniz says, each singular substance expresses the whole universe in its own way and that all its events, together with all their circumstances and the whole sequence of external things, are included in its notion. Or, in Primary Truths, he puts it this way, every individual substance contains in its perfect notion the entire universe and everything that exists in it, past, present, and future. Yet another candidate for a basic primary truth is the principle of the identity of indiscernibles. This principle holds that if two supposedly distinct individuals, two putative individuals, putatively distinct individuals, have all of their properties in common, then they are not two individuals, but one. That is, no two individuals can be exactly alike. So the symbolization here expresses the following. This says that for all properties, for all properties, if all the properties of X are also had by Y, then it follows from that that X equals Y, that they are identical, that they are one and the same thing. Leibniz puts it this way. In nature, there cannot be two individual things that differ in number alone. Now, Leibniz seems to think that this follows from the principle of contradiction and the principle of sufficient reason. Um, I'm going to ask you to perhaps unpack that argument, uh, to try to make sense of that argument in uh, the worksheet from today's lecture. So we saw in the monadology, he seems to think there are two great principles. In some of his earlier works, he seems to think that there might be as many as four. In primary truths, he seems to suggest that there is really only one basic principle, the principle of identity from which everything else is derivable. That principle of identity is the absolutely fundamental principle of all mathematics and abs of absolutely all logic. And it is basically stated by saying that A is equivalent to A. A is A. So he says, The primary truths are those which assert the same thing of itself or deny the opposite of its opposite. For example, and basically everything that follows here is just a different a paraphrase of this original claim. For example, A is A, or what's equivalent to that. A is not not A, or if it is true that A is B, then it is false that A is not B, or that A is not B, etc. Okay? So the primary truths are the fundamental laws of logic. In fact, the fundamental law of logic, the principle of identity. From the principle of identity, a logician can derive the principle of contradiction. Okay? It's not the case that A and not A. And the law of the excluded middle. That um, it, everything that is a, either A or not A, right? Each of those is derivable from the principle, basic principle of identity. And then he goes on to say this. He says, moreover, all remaining truths are reduced to primary truths, are reduced to the principle of identity with the help of definitions. 
that is, through the resolution of notions, or concepts. <clears throat> in this, he says, consists a priori proof, proof independent of experience. Now, that's a dense sentence. Within it is an extraordinary claim. Basically, Leibniz is arguing that all truths can be deduced, deduced a priori, that is, independently of sense experience, by means of applying these basic logical truths to our concepts, using them to analyze our concepts. Another way of putting that, even clearer, is that all true statements he is claiming are fundamentally identity statements which is the claim that all truths are analytic truths. So I want to bring this home to roost by unpacking this a little bit further. Um, we need some introduction to these basic notions. So I think we've talked about the analytic synthetic distinction in class before, but if not, we're going to do it again. Analytic statements, what um, Hume will call relations of ideas, <clears throat> are statements in which the concept of the subject includes or contains the concept of the predicate. So think of a subject predicate sentence. Curry is bald, right? So curry is the subject, bald the predicate. And the way the sentence is working is, right, is we are ascribing the property or the predicate of baldness to curry, right? So it's a subject predicate sentence in which what, what is happening is we are ascribing a predicate, baldness, to a subject, curry. All cats are animals. We're ascribing the predicate animal to the subject, cat. Yes, all bachelors are unmarried men. We're ascribing the predicate, unmarried man, to the subject, bachelor. Now, in each of these cases, the concept of the subject, cat or bachelor, contains or includes the concept of the predicate, right? Unmarried men, sorry, bachelors just are unmarried men. In the concept of bachelor is included the concept of unmarried man. In the concept of cat is included the concept of animal. So, Think about it, right? This is basically a, an identity statement. This statement, all bachelors are unmarried men, is equivalent to the statement, all bachelors are bachelors, right? They mean one and the same thing with only a smallest amount of unpacking. Now, contrast analytic statements with synthetic statements, what Hume calls matters of fact. So synthetic statements are statements in which the concept of the predicate adds something to the concept of the subject. So, for example, all swans are white. The concept of whiteness is not included in the very concept of swaniness. So too, hoppiness is not included in the very idea of frogginess, right? It adds something to our knowledge of frogs to know that they hop. It adds something to our knowledge of swans to know that they are all white. It adds something to your knowledge of Curry to know that he is bald. Now, that's a metaphysical distinction, the distinction between the analytic and the synthetic. That's a, a metaphysical distinction. There's a corresponding, or traditionally there is believed to be, a corresponding epistemological distinction between the a priori and the a posteriori. So remember that something is known a priori if it is known or justified independently of experience. And it is known a posteriori if it is known through sensory experience. So traditionally, it was believed that the analytic and the a priori mapped neatly onto each other, right? How do I know whether or not bachelors are unmarried men? Well, all I have to do is know what it is to be a bachelor, right? All I have to do is analyze the notion in Leibniz's terms or analyze the concept. What do I need to know that 1 plus 1 equals 2? Well, all I need to do is analyze the notion of 1 plus 1, and I will see that it is equivalent to 2. Again, these are identity statements. Okay. On the other hand, if I want to find out whether curry is bald, or swans are white, or my dog has four legs, or there is one chair in this room, I need to do it through sensory experience. I need an appeal to experience. These are synthetic statements, matters of fact. 
Now note that analytic a priori statements are also necessarily true. They are necessary statements. They could not be false. It could not be false that bachelors are unmarried men. Synthetic a posteriori statements, however, are contingent. They can be either true or false. In fact, the example that I gave you, all swans are white, is, in fact, false. So Leibniz's predicate and notion principle holds that all true sentences are analytic sentences. All true sentences are identity statements. Indeed, he claims that a true statement just is one in which the concept of the predicate is included in the concept of the subject. So here's what he says. The predicate or consequent is always in the subject or antecedent, and the nature of truth in general, or the connection between the terms of the statement, consists in this very thing, okay, that the predicate is contained in the subject. He thinks Aristotle held this view. The connection and inclusion of the predicate in the subject is explicit in identities, but in all other propositions it is implicit and must be shown through the analysis of notions. A priori demonstration rests on this. So think about that, right? Bachelors are bachelors. That's an identity statement, right? A is A. Bachelors are unmarried men is not quite as explicit as bachelors are bachelors, but it's pretty damn close, right? Okay. Curry is bald doesn't seem to be an identity statement at all. But Leibniz's claim here, his shocking claim here, is that, in fact, it is. So, we will unpack that a little bit more, but he also thinks that many other important consequences follow from the predicate and notion principle. He thinks the principle of sufficient reason follows from it, and then that the principle of the identity of indiscernibles follows from the principle of sufficient reason. So he says, many things of great importance follow from these considerations, considerations insufficiently attended to because of their obviousness. So he thinks this just all follows from the very principle of identity. It's obvious. It's deducible from it. Okay? But we've missed it because it's too obvious. So for the received axiom that nothing is without reason and there is no effect without a cause, that is the principle of sufficient reason, right? They dir that directly follows from these considerations. Otherwise, here's his argument, there would be a truth which would, could not be proved a priori, that is a truth which could not be resolved into identities, contrary to the nature of truth, which is always an explicit or implicit identity. There is, he says, even a reason for eternal things. If we imagine that the world has been from eternity and we imagine only little balls in it, then we would have to explain why there are little balls rather than cubes. What is the reason for there being little bulbs rather than cubes? So look, here's where we've gone. come. From the basic logical primary truths, the principle of identity, follows the predicate and notion principle. From the predicate of notion principle, follows the principle of sufficient reason. And from the principle of sufficient reason, he argues, follows the principle of the identity of indiscernible. So he says, from these considerations, it also follows that in nature there cannot be two individual things that differ in number alone, for it certainly must be possible to explain why they are different, and that explanation must derive from some difference that they contain. And so what St. Thomas recognized concerning separated intelligences, angels, which he said never differ by number alone, <clears throat> must also be said of other things. For never do we find two eggs or two leaves or two blades of grass in a garden that are perfectly similar. So St. Thomas made the claim, argued, that angels are absolutely sui generis. They are absolutely unique individuals. There are no species of angels, unlike species of things in the natural world. Leibniz is saying that the same thing is true for all things in the world. Each of us is absolutely sui generis. There are no two blades of grass. It is, one way to think about this is the denial that there are kinds at all. There are only absolute, excuse me, absolutely unique things. 
He also says that it follows from this that there are no purely extrinsic denominations, denominations which have absolutely no foundation in the very thing denominated. <clears throat> For it is necessary that the notion of the subject denominated contain the notion of the predicate, and consequently, whenever the denomination of a thing is changed, there must be a variation in the thing itself. Now, this is tricky and rich. Here's what he means. He means that there are no such things as relational properties. A relational property is a property that describes a relationship between two individual things. So, properties like being the son of, or being to the left of, those are relational properties. They describe a relation. Right? And he's denying that there are such things. But in part, this is because he thinks that relational properties are very strange, and they are, if you think about it, strange properties. They don't seem so much to belong to a thing, like being bald does. My baldness belongs to me, in a straightforward sense. Relational properties don't so much seem to belong to something <clears throat> as much as to hang between two things, right? They're sort of out there, but hanging between the two things. They don't seem to be intrinsic, internal to things, but extrinsic, external to them. Yeah? Leibniz rejects the idea that there are any such extrinsic properties or qualities at all. They either reduce to intrinsic properties or are fictional. False, not real. So, for example, the relational, seemingly extrinsic property of Galen being the son of David reduces to two intrinsic properties. The property Galen has of being the son of David and the property David has of being the father of Galen. So, where, who has this property? Galen being the son of David. Well, neither of us have that property. It's sort of floating around out there between us. But I certainly have the property of being the father of Galen, and he certainly has the property of being the son of David. Okay, so when we put all these things together, <clears throat> not easy to do, but we end up with a very curious, I think absolutely fascinating metaphysic. So I'm going to focus on one of these consequences. And actually, there are two points here in this next paragraph. I'm going to pause halfway through, and then we'll make it the rest of the way through. So here's what he says. He says, The complete or perfect notion of an individual substance contains all of its predicates, past, present, and future. For certainly it is now true that a future predicate will be, and so it is contained in the notion of a thing. And thus, everything that will happen to Peter or to Judas, both necessary and free, is contained in the perfect individual notion of Peter or Judas. So the concept of curry includes the property. If I had a full concept of curry, I would see that curry has the property of having been 7.6 pounds at birth, having been 19 inches long at birth, having learned how to ride a bicycle at this particular time in this particular place. It would also include all of the present properties of Curry, his baldness. <clears throat> it would further include all of the future properties of Curry, his being the grandfather of Fred, right? Who is not yet born. Okay. So the complete concept of Curry will include all of Curry's properties, all the Curry properties that Curry has had does have, and will have. He says, from this, it is obvious that God chose from an infinite number of possible individuals those he thought most in accord with the supreme and hidden ends of his wisdom. Properly speaking, he did not decide that Peter sin or that Judas be damned. God didn't determine those things. But only that Peter who would sin with certainty, though not with necessity, but freely uh, check that out, care there. And Judas, who would suffer damnation, would attain existence rather than other possible things, rather than other possible Peters and Judases. That is, he decreed that the possible notion become actual. So there is a possible Curry who has a completely full head of hair, 
and there is a possible Curry who will never have another grandchild. But God didn't create those Curries, right? So out of an infinite number of Curries that God could have created, he chose this one to create. That was God's free choice. In the discourse, Linus puts it this way. Since the individual notion of each person includes once and for all everything that will ever happen to him, one sees in it the a priori proofs of the truth of each event and why one happened rather than another. Let us take an example. Since Julius Caesar will become perpetual dictator and master of the Republic and will overthrow the freedom of the Romans, this action is contained in his notion. For we assume that it is the nature of such a perfect notion of a subject to contain everything so that the predicate is included in the subject. And that's just what this says in Latin. It could be said that it is not in virtue of this notion or idea that he must perform this action, since it pertains to him only because God knows everything. But someone might insist that his nature or form corresponds to this notion, and since God has imposed this personality on him, it is henceforth necessary for him to satisfy it. Leibniz's idea here is that Julius Caesar freely of his own will, becomes perpetual dictator of Rome, the master of the Republic, crosses the Rubicon. And yet, doesn't this raise a problem? So Leibniz raises for himself a problem at the end of this passage that I would like you to think a little bit about. It's a worry. Well, what is that worry? If, in fact, this predicate and notion principle is true, if, in fact, the very concept of Curry includes that Curry will have a grandson by the name of Fred, what does this view seem to imply that we might not be too happy with? So in the next worksheet, I ask you to unpack and comment on that worry. How might Leibniz respond? And by all means, I encourage you to cheat read the rest of Principle 13 in the Discourses and see how Leibniz does respond as it is going to draw a very important distinction there that we will come back to in the next lecture. Relatedly, and I think that's very interesting to ask this question, how would Spinoza respond? So in many ways, Leibniz's philosophy leads him to a place which is very similar to Spinoza's philosophy and yet also in some ways radically different. But in many cases, Leibniz doesn't like where he ends up in a way in which Spinoza at least bites the bullet. The worksheet also is going to ask you about what Leibniz takes to be the grounding of his primary truths. Why should we believe that those primary truths are true? And it gives you some practice with some of the vocabulary and the concepts that have been introduced in this lecture, in particular, the analytic and synthetic distinction. So... So that's the end of this, I'm sorry, overly long lecture and very dense lecture. This is dense material. I'm hopeful that this stuff will uh, give us the groundwork on which we can build in the next few lectures. So please keep in mind that um, office hours, Monday, 1030 to 1130, just uh, there's a link off of the main page, uh, Wednesday, 10 to 11, and we will hold another question and answer session on Friday from 11 to 12 normal, during our normal course time. So, uh, and I will ask you to, to again, um, send, send on questions. Your questions last time were really very good. Um, uh, gave us lots to talk about. Gave me lots to talk about anyways. Sorry about that. Um, uh, and, and I think we'll get more comfortable with y'all talking more as, as we move down the line and get more comfortable with the technology. So until next time, uh, take very good care. Stay safe, um, stay separated, uh, and I will post this soon um, tonight, which is Sunday. Uh, next lecture's worksheet will be due Wednesday at 5, and the next lectures will go up soon after that. Again, take good care. Bye.